right. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Buongiorno e buonasera. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So welcome, everyone, to the second edition, to the second meeting of our Pirandello on Air initiative organized by the Pirandello Society of America. My name is Anna Ilievska. I am a board member and membership secretary of the Pirandello Society of America, and I teach at the University of Chicago. Um, and today I have in conversation with me Luca Cottini, uh, Associate Professor in Italian Studies at Villanova University in the United States. Uh, Luca is a scholar of modern and contemporary Italian literature and a cultural historian. Uh, he received his training in classical philology and literary criticism at the University of Milan, at Notre Dame and Harvard, where he got his PhD from. He specialized in Italian modernist literature, the early developments of industrialism, and the emergence of visual culture in Italy between the 19th and 20th centuries, focusing on such topics as early photography, cinema, advertising, and design. He has a uh, manifold interests, among which are, if I may mention a few, a few epochs, the Italian Baroque, he studied Romanticism and, of course, Modernism. Uh, he has two monographs on Calvino, one on Calvino and the other one on the art of objects, the birth of Italian industrial culture, 1878-1928, which came out in 2018. He's written several articles on Palatesti, Papini, D'Annunzio, D'Amici, Spenoglio, uh, many different names from Italian literature. And most excitingly, he has now had a podcast called Italian Innovators. Please follow it uh, on YouTube uh, that I just heard from Luca has had about 5,000 views in the past month. Yay, for Italian studies. <laughs> We've moved out of the classroom and into the marketplace, into the World Wide Web, and I'm really happy about that. Um, so Luca will tell us a little bit more about his research first before we delve into the topic of Pirandello um, in the context of Italian industrialism and modernity and technology. So Luca, welcome. It's great to have you here. Welcome. Um, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. How is uh, Coast doing? How is Philadelphia? One of my favorite cities in the United States. Oh, doing well. I mean, uh, <laughs> enjoying the snow at this point. <laughs> with after the blizzard, uh, it's the it, situation here in Chicago. We're covered in snow. Look, so tell me, how did you arrive in this at this specific research topic? The, you study design. You study objects specifically. You've uh, written a lot about um, the record, the recording industry, um, Olivetti. Uh, so let us let us hear about more. How how did you arrive there, and then tell us about the podcast in general. Well, um, I'm a classical philologist that observes design as a very serious uh, matter. Uh, so in this sense, uh, I try to combine my uh, philological formation, my literary formation in Italy, and I normally write about literature in Italian with um, my uh, formation here in the United States, uh, where uh, Italian culture is observed uh, not necessarily from the sole uh, high point of literature, but as a whole in the intersection of many different uh, disciplines. So in my case, um, design, photography, uh, silent cinema. And uh, I arrived here uh, through the encounter of uh, with certain professors uh, at Notre Dame uh, when I arrived in, in my master's program uh, with, with John Welly, uh, who uh, studied silent cinema and introduced me to kind of a reflection on the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century uh, cinema. Then at, at Harvard, I worked on photography with Giuliana Minghelli, and then on uh, design with, with Jeffrey Schnapp, uh, who were both my mentors there. Uh, I worked on the late 19th century because I think it's a time that um, defines our present. Uh, it's a time where in the 40 years between 1880 and 1920, we have a plethora of inventions that completely revolutionize our, our uh, perception and experience of the world in the same way as over the last 40 years, um, the, the new inventions, the internet, the iPhone and the internet of things are revolutionizing our human experience in a way. So I observe this, a hundred years ago as a way to understand our present and as a way to tap into this um, age, I had to deal with the dualism that observes this age as uh, decadence, decadentismo in Italian literature. 
uh, so an age of crisis and irrationalism as seen through the lens of literature and uh, an age of modernism, of excitement, of new inventions, of acceleration, of urban development, global uh, industrialization uh, as seen from the lens of industry. So if you put together the two narrations of decadentism, which is kind of an a posteriori concept that Croce uh, applied to from fascism backward into this age of crisis and the narration of modernism, which in Italy only refers to architecture or the so-called material cultures and to the ecclesial realm um, because modernism was a heresy condemned in 1907 by Pius X. Tenth, uh, exactly. was, was supposed to have been the only person who exactly knew what modernism is. He's the only one. No one else could define modernism except Pope Pius. So this is one of the reasons why the word modernism doesn't uh, develop in in the Italian context. It's a European concept. Uh, it's been developed over the past couple of decades here in the United States. The approach to Italian modernist literature. My concern was how do I observe this age that defines it itself in a decadent key as fin de siècle and at the same time in a, an, excitement, an exciting key as belle époque. Mm -hmm. uh, the two elements go together in, and in the same way are the elements that define our modernity because modernity is both crisis and progress at the same time. They're the two faces of the same uh, present, state of transition in the present. In order for something new to develop, something old must enter into crisis. So. I couldn't agree more, Luca. I feel I so I wrote my dissertation on a very similar topic, and one of the claims that I made are almost identical to what you were just saying. That precisely the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, is what we are living today is almost like a like an exaggerated mirror image of what individuals and authors, intellectuals, the common people were experiencing at the time. So somehow I feel like going back to that period, to that defining period could help us better understand the situation in which we're living now, both technologically and artistically speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in this context, like the idea of working on objects was kind of an intermediate point where I could tap into the work of industry, the word of industry and the word of culture, uh, with two words that actually mean the same thing. Industria in Latin means laboriousness, cultura means cultivation. They both refer to the experience of bearing fruit, of multiplying the human experience, of optimizing it. So in, in this sense, it makes sense that in the Italian context, uh, objects that are industrial, serial, um, based on a repetition, um, you say uh, anonymous in a way, standardized, are endowed with a cultural or aesthetic element. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was not just like a, a, a strategic positioning uh, because Italy was very late in, the, in its industrialization. And so it had to kind of add with beauty and aesthetics uh, a distinctive element that could make the product competitive. Uh, but this is also part of a, of a longer range um, that goes back to, if you want, Leonardo and the idea of techne, of technique. Uh, techne in Greek means both uh, the art of doing things well, but also the art of doing things meaning. So arts in our common sense. Uh, um, so the, 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 the ingenium of, of Leonardo, the word ingenium is, is intelligence that uh, is both a practical intelligence, creating solutions, designing solutions, and an aesthetic cultural intelligence. So ingenium is the word from which in English comes the word um, engineer, but also the word ingenuity. Uh, so uh, the, the ingenuous engineer is really uh, kind of that intermediate figure that is generated by this encounter of several entrepreneurs and uh, intellectuals at the turn of the 19th uh, of the 20th century uh, that will define then later the profile of what Joe Ponti would call the designer. It's kind of like a hybrid figure as both an intellectual and a maker. Uh, it's the one that provides an object, a serial object with an authenticity. So yeah, I, think, I think this is a point worth dwelling on, especially when you mentioned the Greek word techne. Uh, this is something that I think our students, at least when we teach at the university, are not quite aware of, that the word technology, the contemporary word technology, comes from that Greek word meaning techne, and that originally that word uh, was applied to, like you said, it had an aesthetic, 
an aesthetic uh, dimension and then an industrial dimension. It was, it was applied to things that were both creative, artistic in the way that we perceive aesthetic objects today and just simple tools, simple kind of crafts. So with Leonardo, you say he kind of combined these two. And if I understand you correct correctly, Italian modernity, modernism, if you may call it as, as such, uh, where it lacked on industry, it compensated with an aesthetic contribution. Mm -hmm. It contributed with its own perception of techne or interpretation of techne. Yeah, this also also goes back to the culture of the bottega, the workshops in uh, in the Renaissance. Uh, and the bottega were those schools for uh, painters. All the great painters were in the bottega of a great master, but also for people in, in the arts, in the crafts. So la bottega by Stradivari, uh, violin making, or Amati, Guarnier, near Cremona, or the bottega for learning embroidery, uh, like in the, the early fashion uh, kind of communication of, of crafts and skills. And uh, what happens in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, is really the passage from this artisanal dimension of the bottega to a more um, uh, mature and global and structured um, way of manufacturing object that doesn't remove the aesthetic intention also the craft, the manual craft, the, the deposit of skills, but um, brings them to a larger scale. So in the sense, the designer is the one who designs a unique piece, but not a solo piece, but rather a unique prototype. So mm -hmm. a model that can be then replicated and give authenticity and, gen and genuineness to uh, a product that inevitably uh, is um, multiplicated in a number of in infinite number of copies. So and yet, and yet original, yet very characteristic, right? So Luca, uh, to move on to another, I mean, it's the same subject, but another issue that really interests me and that I kind of picked up from reading your books. Um, so we're talking about the 19th century. Normally, usually in American academia, in the world, just the cliche of Italy is always this country that is, you know grand, magnificent, which it is, of course, and this is why we all love it and study it and want to go there. Uh, but there's this idea when you mentioned Italy of Dante, the Renaissance, the successful, beautiful period of the churches, the aesthetics. And yet in the 19th century, Italy was far than being this, the cultural center in Europe or in the world. In the 19th century, Italy, when it comes to industrialism, was a latecomer, right? Can we then, in a way, situate Italy within the European landscape in the 19th century, more uh, in a kind of Southern discourse. Can we do that? And I'm referring here to something that you wrote also in your book, uh, The Art of Objects. I quote, unlike England and Germany, which had rapidly expanded between the first exposition of London in 1851 and the economic crisis of 1873, Italy had not developed a national industry because of the limited size of its domestic marketplace and its reliance on foreign resources. And I think what you're saying here, I have very much read in other secondary literature, major contributions by Roberto Dainotto and Franco Cassano, which would absolutely agree with you in this kind of late coming of Italy to industry and take this as an opportunity to uh, put Italy within the context of a global South not of the center, but of a global side of a kind of different gaze at industrialization. Would you agree with that? Well, basically, uh, this is an historical fact. I mean, uh, after the depression of 1873, uh, Italy goes undergoes like a very uh, dire agrarian crisis. And um, Italy is still kind of trying to square its national debt after the um, independence war. So uh, there's a certain relax reluctance toward kind of in the investment in the industrialization, not only uh, at the ideological level for fear of episodes like the Parisian Commune, Commune in, uh, in the early 1870s, but like also uh, because Italy relies heavily on foreign investment. Uh, both to pay off the debt and to develop new infrastructures. Uh, among the possible investments, one that doesn't go through is particularly striking, um, which is the project to uh, bring a railroad uh, line connecting Calais 
uh, in, in France to Brindisi uh, in southern Italy. This project fails uh, and this could have been like a project that could connect northern France to Brindisi and then the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, at the end of 1869, uh, which could have opened like a completely different path for the Italian South. Uh, the failure of this uh, project is related to the lack of infrastructures, uh, especially roads in the, in the south, uh, which was related to an export economy uh, of landowners that were producing in isolation for export, not for the development of an internal uh, economy. So uh, with the vanishing of this project, basically the two main harbors become like Genoa and, and Trieste in the north. And the South uh, undergoes like a moment of uh, reconfiguration, mm -hmm. uh, which is also related to kind of the development of a new Atlantic economy uh, with the expansion of uh, the Americas, especially Argentina and Brazil for the, and also the United States, the production of wheat. And the consequence that like the South, which had the Italian South, which had been like uh, since the uh, voyages of Columbus, uh, the main exporter of wheat yes, uh, in Europe and the world. Already writing of, of Sicily in that way. Cicero was saying, like in the Roman time, Sicily was the producer of wheat, of bread for Rome. So. Yeah, this is the first time in which actually the South becomes an importer of wheat because the American wheat costs much less. Uh, and uh, so th this is an interesting situation where um, the also uh, awareness of um, kind of the industrial development is placed within a global context. Now, uh, normally we trace the, mar the beginning date of Italian industrialism uh, in 1878, mm -hmm. uh, which is the year in which the first protectionist measures were passed by the Italian uh, parliament. So um, this is an attempt to develop an industrial project, but also to defend uh, the Italian economy in, in, in this sense and kind of make it less a land uh, owned by others and more kind of a land developing a new model. So French invest, uh, investors, right? If I understand correctly, French well, there, were, there were several kinds of investors like French uh, investors uh, were um, at the center of a controversy uh, following the protectionist laws of 1878 uh, because the damage, uh, the, the, the bigger damage was on the French economy of, for, for these protectionist measures. And uh, this led to a commercial tension with France, which was then seen in the episode of Tunisia, uh, 1881 became a protectorate of France, but it, Italy actually had its eyes on, on Tunisia. And uh, the protectionist measures uh, actually uh, were um, reinforced then later in 1887. Uh, and um, France retaliated uh, against these measures by uh, withdrawing the investments on Italian banks. And this withdrawal of investments is what will lead in 1893 to the crisis of the Italian bank system. Uh, now, among the investors, there, was, there were also German investors, uh, because after the commercial war with France, uh, Italy in 1882, for, for Tunisia, Italy in 1882, enters in the Triple Alliance as a retaliation against France. And so German investors start to put money into the Italian economy, especially in the development of navigation companies and harbors and, and infrastructures, uh, especially in Genoa, um, the Navigazione Generale Italiana uh, and La Veloce, which were the two uh, navigation lines owned by Italians, were actually funded by German banks. Yeah. And also Americans invested heavily in, uh, especially in electricity with the founding in 1884 of the Edison plant in uh, near Milan. It's the first kind of electricity plant uh, in Italy. So, um, Amazing. So it's kind of safe to assume, I would say, that in this period that we're talking about in which Pirandello, our topic for today, uh, during which he wrote, Italy was kind of an industrial periphery. It was a, a European periphery that was mostly dependent on foreign capital and therefore couldn't really dispose of its own industry, of its own means. It couldn't really extend its road. It was always dependent on the decision. Mm -hmm. the yeah, so in this sense, like the, the logic of creating yeah. a distinguishing element with beauty yeah. makes sense. But also, we can trace here one of the distinguishing characters of then the later Italian design, the success of later Italian design, which is the perception of uh, scarcity, the perception of being in a the frontier at the limit of something. And limit is actually one of the uh, most important creative tools uh, because the ability to find a way out of limit 
is what forces the aesthetic urgency to find solutions. This in the 20th century design, but also in the Renaissance, because like we talk about the Renaissance, Michelangelo, Leonardo, but the, the 16th century in Italy was a, a disaster politically. So it, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's this sense of constant crisis of being always at the limit that forces a different creativity and uh, generates not kind of the, the kind of laziness of self-contentment of those who are kind of already rich, but forces to use the leftover creatively. This is kind of like the, the, the basis of Italian cuisine too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm, yeah, that sounds amazing. Like the conflict, but somehow the, precisely the absence of stability of maybe even coherent national identity and industry is what kind of makes the Italian difference. Mm -hmm. What is what created that kind of diversity, that mix of different voices that we that we study? Very good. So yeah. Italy has a constant laboratory of incompleteness. The state of incompleteness, to me, is not a state of uh, flawed system, but it's actually the very DNA of the success that Italy brought later in this kind of restlessness, urge to always. Uh, find solutions that could be useful and meaningful at the same time. So culture and industry. Laboratory of incompleteness. I think that is an excellent, excellent way of describing the situation. Right. And um, in your book, you also mentioned the Giro d'Italia. One of the, the, the features that I thought really well exemplified and how slowly but steadily the south, the extreme south of Italy was excluded from the growing industrialization of the north. You're right. The Giro d'Italia excitingly provided Italians with a new awareness of their of their country's geography and with a sense of collective participation in a truly national experience, right? The invention of the bicycle and these new races kind of uh, uh, corse, you know, provided a, a reason, a more unifying element for Italian identity. But at the same time, the Giro d'Italia stopped in the south, stopped in Naples, if I remember correctly. When, where did it end? It, Oh. Even north, like in the first one, uh, did not include the south, uh, mainly for the lack of roads uh, and, and the islands as well. Um, so if you observe the map, the map of the 1909 Giro d'Italia, it's basically a, a southless map of a, of a truncated Italy. And this goes back to the lack of infrastructure in the south and especially roads that we discussed, uh, which comes from a, a land owning structure that grew in isolation for uh, export, external export, not a kind of the development of internal economy. Uh, this being said, um, certainly there are like limits brought by this lack of infrastructure in the South, but um, the South also um, knew like an incredible development in terms of infrastructure uh, with regard to uh, ports and harbors, and I'm uh, referring here to Naples and uh, Palermo. Uh, Naples, thanks also to the growing traffic of, of people, masses of people that were starting to leave Italy and go mainly in South America in the late 19th century and starting from the 20th century in the United States, um, the, the Italian harbors really um, developed a certain, uh, a significant wealth. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it is not a chance that in 1889 in Naples, uh, the biggest department store in Europe uh, opens uh, with the Magazzini Mele. Uh, the Magazzini Mele was kind of the Italian Harrods, and it's significant that it develops in um, Napoli. Uh, so I, I tell the story about like this development because like Mele was the first one who hired uh, recorded designers, recorded illustrators that were working on Mele promotion of operas uh, for the promotion of their own products and the, the Mele series of posters indicates not just the beginning of Italian advertising, but also indicates a significant wealth that was spinning around the city of Naples. And for, with regard to Palermo, Palermo in 1891 is the city that hosts like a national exposition that launches the culture of liberty in, in Sicily. And liberty has an immense expansion in Sicily. Um, now, what is significant is that like in Palermo, one of the great entrepreneurs is actually Florio. Uh, um, Florio is like a navigation company uh, that um, actually invests on the first 
a shipyard, il cantiere Florio uh, di Palermo, like in 1897. So it's like the biggest uh, shipyard in Italy at, the, at, at, the point, at, at that point. And Florio uh, merges with uh, Rubattino, which is like a Genoese uh, shipyard company, to form the Navigazione Generale Italiana. Uh, now, Rubattino had like a line going to the Red Sea and actually was the company that bought like an outpost in Massawa, Eritrea, in 1869, around which then Italy started to build the Eritrean um, colony, uh, starting from the early uh, 1880s. But like uh, Florio had the line toward uh, the Americas. So their merger uh, made in, in, in Navigazione Generale Italiana made Italy really connected to large parts of the of the world and, and this is part of the discovery of italy uh of, of the world by by italians uh, and, and, and it's significant so the first the biggest european department store was open in naples in the, at the end of the 19th century if i get it correctly mele yes right. uh, it, it uh, failed in 1929 um, because of the financial crisis but it's really uh, an experience that is worth uh, exploring uh, and uh, contextualizing also the um, uh, wealth of the city of Naples uh, with the development of like a significant literature related to Naples and not just Il Ventre di Napoli, uh, talking about the experience of cholera, uh, Matilde Serrao, uh, but also really the the development of uh, uh, a significant culture. Uh, it's, it, it's something to study. <laughs> Quite interestingly, uh, in our contemporary time in Sicily, very close to Catania, there is, uh, from what, what I've read, uh, one of the three biggest commercial centers, malls in Europe, which is called Etnopolis. So we have a kind of similar phenomena today, a mirroring Naples at the end of the 19th century, century today, apparently in the whole of Italy, the biggest shopping mall is in Sicily, is close to Catania. No, this is to say like that um, certain discourses about like the belatedness of Italy or the belatedness of the South are certainly very legitimate, but they also have like a, a flip side which is the more this is dire the more this becomes a laboratory of, of experiences to uh, develop new forms and it forces this uh, creativity to come out uh, in, in in the dialogue with other uh, realities and this is kind of what southerner uh, southern writers experience especially in the late 19th century going to the north and speaking about Verga and Pirandello going to Germany. Um, so, and, and encountering through the through the other, a kind of a, 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 an, an external perspective allowing them to um, internalize in a way and, and make aware what the distinguishing element of their own culture is. Yes, they so. have a very unique gaze. It was a gaze of an outsider to industrialization, but there was kind of going to find the center of events and kind of being influenced by them. And in any case, when we, while we're speaking still of the South and Italy is being potentially considered as a part of the global South in the 19th century and even parts of it today, um, you gave an example of the first radio performance in the United States, which was at uh, New York's Metropolitan Opera. And it was of course performed through uh, Marconi's invention, radio invention. So it, the first opera that was ever um, uh, how do, what is the word that was ever uh, aired? I would say, like <laughs> aired, right? Streamed or aired in the United States was through a, an Italian product, Marconi, Marconi's radio, and then it was uh, an opera sang by Caruso, a Neapolitan tenor, one of the most famous ones at the time. And the opera that, that he sang was Cavalleria Rusticana, based on a story by the Sicilian Giovanni Verga. So mm -hmm. it's layers of southernness, so to say, under this kind of the, the, the facade of the of the advancement industrialism of the American uh, society at the time. No, and definitely this this uh, dialectics of inside outside view is actually the core of uh, Pirandello's work. If you think about it, it's it's really La Jara is the story of someone who observes like a big. Uh, jar base <laughs> uh, uh, from the outside and from the inside. Um, and Enrico IV, Enrico IV is uh, the, the story of someone who, who observes uh, life from the inside of his 
uh, psychological life or madness and uh, from the outside uh, through the lens of uh, the, the the other characters or if you think about like the six characters in search of an author is once again this kind of reverting the vision on the inside from the perspective of the outside and this is also the perspective of serafino gubbio sure. that observes like cinema and technology uh from the inside from the the eyes of the actors but also from the outside and see how how does it look from the outside so in this sense the uh, technological development of modernity of those years that we discussed is actually something that in italy has uh, a different and i think more profound uh outlook in the sense that products that are somewhere else used for immediate consumption uh once they are placed within this context uh, within this kind of long-term tradition uh, heritage, they start to be interrogated. They start to be questioned. Um, so in this sense, culture uh, enters the debate. And, and it would be the same thing as if, like, you know, you, if you buy an iPad in an Apple store, uh, you use it. Uh, right away, or if you buy an iPad in an Apple store, you know, place it in a canvas. Uh, the space of a canvas would start um, would begin kind of an interrogative gaze on, on the iPad. So in the sense, culture starts to interrogate these new things. Um, Leo writes uh, uh, the 13th and, and in secret called Rerum Novarum, the new things, on the new things. So in this sense, uh, the sense, the gaze of culture, the external gaze of someone who is marginalized is actually an advantage to observe what these technologies entail. And in this sense, Pirandello is really a key figure. In your book, uh, Luca, The Art of Objects from 2018, um, you take a lot of recourse to literature, of course, to make your argument. Um, and I've noticed that so much of the examples that, that deal with like the new technological developments, with the new discourses at the time, come from Southern Italian authors in particular. So could, I, could we say something like that Italian uh, modernity, Italian industrialism, while it happened in the north of Italy, it was narrated by the South. It was mostly the South tried to come, come, come to terms with it, uh, um, culturally speaking. Yeah, certainly there is like a, an external gaze or uh, an other gaze, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, key in discerning and finding out the differences. And uh, this is really a dynamic that we find, for example, in Italian studies in the United States, like the encounter with a different culture, a radically different culture, inherently, intrinsically forces uh, perhaps Italians or people who are uh, American scholars um, with, with an interest toward Italy to figure out the element of difference um, and actually to read through that you, through that otherness, um, an element that defines, for example, American culture. Uh, and in, in this encounter where the internal and external gaze uh, continuously interact, uh, there's a possibility of using one culture to read the other and using one culture to understand oneself. So in this sense, this happens for Verga uh, moving from Sicily to Milan, uh, to Pirandello moving from Sicily to Berlin, uh, to Bonn and then to Rome. Um, but again, I also want to highlight the fact that despite you know the number of authors that, that I mentioned, so Serrao, Verga, Pirandello, Capuana, uh, that are coming from the South and that interrogate uh, their own culture and the new culture uh, from this um, internal, external perspective, there are also other authors from the South uh, that um, actually start to engage with this new culture and start to work with this culture as a platform to develop new uh, forms and new languages. And I want to mention two southerners. Uh, one is Gabriele D'Annunzio, uh, Abruzzese. And D'Annunzio is really the first uh, Italian uh, writer that starts to understand the logic of the industry, not only cinema, uh, authoring Cabiria, so the logic that the industry needs culture to become uh, to, to, um, authentic. Uh, culture authenticates a serial product. So in this sense, the grief, the signature of D'Annunzio to Cabiria is a significant moment where the industry recognizes that without an authorship, this product that is serial would be anonymous. 
-hmm. So this is the same logic of the fashion designer that authors uh, a t-shirt or uh, the designer that designs the prototype of a product and then is replicated. So that design is what gives authenticity and genuineness to the new things. So this is really the studying of the um, um, work, common work of industry and culture. But uh, Danuzzi is also the first who understands the uh, logic of the intersection of literature with other um, disciplines. So with photography, uh, the photography, the photographs that Danunzio uh, works on are really the beginning of the construction of a visual identity or a brand identity. Uh, he's the first intellectual who starts to promote himself and uh, as, as an entrepreneur of himself. And also the idea that literature is connected to fashion Mm -hmm. um, D'Annunzio uh, was right. a, a stylista. Uh, he actually designed his own uh, clothes and he actually designed his own perfumes, as I tell in the last episode of Italian Innovators, uh, where I really trace like a, uh, a history of Italian perfumes through the uh, experience of like Italy's now top maître perfumier, uh, Maria Candida Gentile. But to go back to D'Annunzio, D'Annunzio is really the one who connects the logic that culture needs to reinvent itself in an industrial form, not becoming serialized, but becoming something that gives a unique and genuine voice, a, a genuine grief to the industrial product. The second example is actually uh, a, an artist from Reggio Calabria, uh, who is uh, Umberto Boccioni, uh, who works uh, in Milano and becomes a futurist. And uh, what is interesting in Boccioni's work is really this, excitement, this tension to always reproduce like a unique gesture, a unique dynamism, something which is unrepeatable, which is like the core of the futurist serate, uh, which were not uh, written on, on a script, but they were like always unrepeatable, always new. So this is really a key element in understanding the Italian approach toward in industrialization, which celebrates it, uh, for its dynamism and energy and muscularity and development, but at a certain point interrogates it, saying, well, you know, this industrialization comes at the cost of serializing or prepackaging uh, our expression. So in this sense, Boccioni coming from the South perceives this, and in every Boccioni sculpture or painting, you see this gesture of affirming a distinctiveness, a unique... Um, element. Uh, you find it also in Impressionism, you know, the uh, recovery of the still life, which is kind of like a serial genre, is uh, a recovery of this serial space, but also this space where the quest of variation, the quest of uniqueness is the point. And it doesn't come as a surprise that like Morandi or De Chirico or uh, Severini rediscover this space as a way to find in the serial language of industry, something that can be both serial and unique, both useful and meaningful, uh, which is what the designer does, again. I think you say that there, it sounds like there are three different positions on industrialism in, in Italy at the time. So on one hand, you mentioned there's the kind of enthusiasm of, of uh, uh, Danunzio, of Mochoni, uh, uh, and of course the futurists who glorified the machine who made it there. Uh, their, their goddess in a way and, and uh, technology, but in a kind of quite exaggerated way. I mean, when I when I think of Anuncio, I think of saturation of mm -hmm. uh, classicism, extreme kind of language, extreme rhetoric. So we have that kind of reaction. Then we have someone like Benedetto Croce, who is completely rejecting anything new in terms of like industrialism, because that, that was, as you write, that was a degradation in light of his purism, of his aesthetic purism. And then finally, I feel we have the extreme southerners, if I may say so. We have Pirandello, we have Verga, who are, I feel, the, the ones who are most productively trying to deal from a cultural perspective with the phenomena of industrialization. They're the ones who are trying to find out how do we deal with this? It's not so much about producing a new aesthetic like Danunzio and the Turisti wanted to do. It's a total rejection, although we have very a very hostile attitude in Pirandello's work towards industry, of course. But it's about kind of reconciling the two and thinking about ways in which we can coexist with these technological uh, mm -hmm. new kind of industry. 
Yeah, in, in what you said, you, you basically confirmed like the whole idea of the laboratory, uh, which is an irregular laboratory. Italy is not, uh, the development of design of this culture in Italy is not observed until the 1960s in traditional scholarship, because what happens before is actually uh, very confused and very irregular and very uh, dishomogeneous in a way, as you, as you described. Now, I want to uh, defend a little bit D'Annunzio and his ex exaggerated sty stylization of, yeah. of his tone, because this is really the key for developing a language, for example, in branding a product. And uh, when you were talking about D'Annunzio, I had in mind uh, the stylization of Versace uh, and his obsessive return to the classics and to obsessive return that you also find in the logo, the Medusa. The Medusa by Versace was like a, a memory from Gianni Versace of Reggio Calabria. Mm -hmm. He was from Reggio Calabria as well, uh, of like an archeological site, a, a mosaic in an archeological site with the head of a, of a Medusa. And that kind of became Becomes like a constant reoccurrence. The classics that are not copied, um, mm. but they are constantly reinvented in dialogue with the market, the modern world, the transient. And this is also what D'Annunzio does in his exaggerated classicism, but also in his keen attention to uh, the modern developments and, and, and phenomena, like you know, airplanes. He writes the first novel on airplanes, for second, for second, no, in 1911. And uh, what you were saying about the gaze of the intellectual can be summarized also by the visit that I start the book from of the, uh, the Amicis at the 1878 uh, World Exposition of Paris, where he is an Italian, an outsider uh, that observes like this phenomenon. Um, there were other intellectuals like, you know, Baudelaire did it, uh, Marx did it with these uh, phenomena like the Universal Expositions, but the gaze of the Amicis is different because it comes from this Italian long-term tradition that forces him to ask in front of these novelties, this ephemera, what does it remain? Cosa resta of this? So in this sense, the intellectual interrogates the length of these novelties as a way to ponder them because there are some in this plethora of novelties there are some that will resist and that will become eventually science or what we call literature or something that will become an icon in the market and some of these novelties will be forgotten uh, in in 20 years all the novelties of our time probably will remember five percent of them uh, so in this sense, the Amicis points to this dynamic and Pirandello points to the, this dynamic too and refers it to both culture and objects. So culture is kind of the famous opening of Il Fumatia Pascal saying, well, of all the books that we are writing and they're published every year, in 10 years, probably 50% will be remembered. In 100 years, probably 1% will be remembered. The other will become dust. Uh, what we call literature, or what we call the classics, it was, is what remains of this uh, outfashioning of this platter of, of uh, products, creations. On the other hand, Pirandello, very, um, like, I, I want to dispel the idea of Pirandello as a, as a conservative or like a backward leaning writer. He actually uh, observes in, in his novelle, uh, phenomena that are taking place right in front of him with a lot of irony, uh, where the irony is meant to ask questions. One, one, one example uh, that I make in the uh, book that relates to bicycles, um, there's a very famous uh, short story, it's called Mondo di Carta, Paper World, where uh, Pirandello opposes like the figure of a, um, an old man, Valeriano Balicci, who then eventually becomes blind, and a young uh, woman who um, starts to kind of travel around with boats, ships, trains, and bicycles as well. And uh, Balici reads uh, books, travel books, um, but has never been to those places of the books. Whereas uh, the, the girl, uh, Tilde, uh, can say, well, you know, I've been there and it's not like the book is saying. Uh, so this knowledge by experience that is introduced is something interesting, but it's also the provocation that forces the other either to cling to old models and the, 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 the clinging of Balicci to his books, even though he's blind, that need to be always the same as he was used to. It's actually a very ironic portrait of many intellectuals or really to kind of develop a new way uh, yeah. with, with what we're given, with the time that we're 
Yeah. And, and the changes that this time is bringing forth. So this, this particular short story that you address, Mondo di Carta, is very symptomatic of that more balanced kind of attitude that Pirandello had towards technology mm -hmm. and modernity. It's not, like you said, that kind of conservative, historically conservative perceived approach of his towards modernity. And we have, as you said, on one side, we have Valeriano, this character who goes blind and reads books and has someone read books to him even after he goes blind and he hires this woman, this girl, Hilde, who is uh, basically all about experience. She has traveled all over the world and their two worlds conflict because Valeriano insists the description of a cathedral in Norway is the correct one where she says, I have been there, I have seen it, it is not the same. And we see here that Pirandello gives us both points of view. It's not just... And, and, he, doesn't, and he doesn't tell us Mm -hmm. which one is best. Exactly. He's telling us through their dialogue that the two words need to enter into relationship. And this is actually, the two words are like the two components of art that Baudelaire defines in his famous like quote uh, in, uh, in the painter of, the, of, of modern life, like, you know, one half is ephemeral and the other half is immutable. So the two elements must um, coexist in a way, the, the eternal has to have a present contingent, whereas the present contingent need to be followed up, otherwise it would be uh, outmoded. And this is really a key component of the Italian approach to industrialism, where in the experience of many entrepreneurs, especially during the 20th century, uh, the idea of producing ephemeral object, commercial items, is always associated to the creation of these objects as artworks. And I'm referring here to, for example, Olivetti, uh, who uh, designed uh, expo expositive spaces, so retail stores, that were actually a museum. I invite you to go check out the um, Olivetti store in uh, St. Mark's Square in Venice under the portico, uh, designed by Carlos Carpa in 1956, where he, Olivetti, placed the typewriters not to be sold, but to be uh, exposed as in a, in a museum space. So the object that was once sold is now a work of art. This is a dynamic that you see also, for example, in Florence in the, Much, in the Gucci Museum or the Ferragamo Museum. So the tension to transform the product into uh, a work of art, something that is as durable as a literary classic. So that we can keep it in a, in a library and, and, and keep it for, forever and can last forever. So we can say that maybe if for Danuncio, if the symbol was the head of the Medusa, this very ancient uh, symbol, and then for the futurist, it was the God machine, war, and all, all, all the connotations of industrialism at the time. Then for Pirandello, the most logical thing we could say is precisely the image that comes out of Serafino Gubbio, the man with the machine, the man with the camera, kind of working together to come to terms with the new life. Um, and uh, Luca, in your book, you also mentioned a few other stories and most, I found it very intriguing, this idea of how Italians resisted the uniformization of time. And you gave examples from Leonora, Dio and Palatoline and marbles by Pirandello. Can, can you tell us something more about that? Well, certainly uh, this relates to uh, what happens in 1883. Uh, in Italy, which is kind of the uh, geodetic conference that takes place in Rome for the determination of the uh, origin of time, uh, establishing the need, the universal need for science and industry to define a common reference point for time, uh, which is what will be ratified in 1884 in the Meridian Conference of DC uh, with the establishment of Greenwich as uh, the first meridian and then the later uh, division of the earth in time zones. This was done because like of the difficulty to uh, calculate time uh, for especially the railway system uh, in, in the United States and in Canada. Uh, so it was the reconfiguration of time according to the needs, the new needs of industrialization. But uh, within this context, uh, Italy accepts the new meridian, the central meridian in 1893, uh, and Paris will accept it in 1911. Uh, so uh, this is really, really a, a diplomatic contention. Um, but uh, it, within this context, it is actually quite striking and quite ironic. We are native, natives of this and we don't get it anymore, but actually to say that the origin of time 
that has always been related to the heavens, the rotation of the uh, the planets, the, the the moon, the the earth around the sun, or the origin of time the, in metaphysics, uh, God and I pray a priori category in in, in Kant. To say that the origin of time is London is actually quite funny. Uh, or to say that the origin of time is an algorithm that allows the Earth, which is a, a, a spheroid flattened at the poles, to have like uniform 24 hours, it's quite funny. It, it, it doesn't measure up to the, 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 the enormity of the question. So as a way to ironically point this out, um, Pirandello asked the question in uh, like, uh, in, uh, Leonora Dio like asked the question to the tower bell, which was um, the the sign, the symbol of a time that was related to transcendence. Um, within this new time that is completely immanent to our industrialization, and immanent also in the sense that what was on the tower bell now is on the wristwatch that we can possess. Within this time, like. What is it then? What is our time? What, what, what does it remain? We would say. And uh, Gozzano in Le Due Strade, uh, talking about like bicycles, asks uh, one cyclist that is accompanying, uh, whom is accompanying, uh, who is standing, and one cyclist that is moving, like, vola dove la bicicletta? Like, the, the bicycle is flying, but where? So this time is flying, but where? And the other, the other interesting. Um, short story Pallottolini presents this uh, character of uh, a philosopher, astronomer, that is actually saying that the planets are all wrong and uh, there, are, there are Pallottolini, marbles, and, and, and that the sun is no longer able to indicate a time that is as precise as the industrialization would require. So he brings like this uh, watch uh, that has like a slogan on it, like uh, the sun brings only false hours. And this is part of like a reaction uh, not in, in the reactionary sense, but like a reaction as a, a pondering of the changes that dares to ask the question like, but within this new context, where we all establish that our time is now a fiction because we live in a time that is a fiction. Um, my, my meridian and my time uh, now is the same as the time in Boston, but the solar time in Boston is completely different than, than the time in Philadelphia. Uh, yes. Even though they are on the clock, they are the same. So within this fiction, that we all accept, then what is time? And, and in this sense, the critique to the sun that you find expressed also in painting, uh, the, the discrepancy between the, the solar hour and the fictional hour that we established, um, that we find in uh, Mezzogiorno sulle Alpi, uh, noon in the Alps of uh, Segantini, where the noon has like a very long shade, <laughs> or you find it in the Enigma de Lora, Enigma of the Hour, 1911, by the Chirico, where the 2.55 p.m. that is indicated on top of a railway station does not correspond to the 2.55 or it might be like 5 p.m. that the shades are actually indicating on, on the piazza. So this is this discrepancy where the two words are internal convention of time and the external awareness that time runs on, despite our calculation, time still runs on the sun, um, opens up a space of reflection that I think is not as explicit in other contexts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think Pirandello in the, in the few short stories that you mentioned definitely comes to terms with these and puts a kind of critical approach, especially in Palopolina. I, I love that story, the character who lives close to Rome when he says the sun is not even good enough to regulate watches, as you said, and il sole non è neanche buono da regolare gli orologi, with like an irony that is so characteristic of Pirandello at the same time, it's fascinating. Right, uh, look, I think we're almost coming to, to the end of our hour. <laughs> It has been really, time has flown. Time has flown talking about Italian literature and culture. So what can we take away? Um, you said that Italy's modernity, Italy's modernism and industrialization, we can see it from the perspective of a laboratory of something that is constantly changing even today, that is constantly on the move. What can be the take from Pirandello uh, to, be, to make it a little bit more the focus of our talk and to learn from him and from Italian uh, industry and design from the 19th end of the 19th century for the current century. What is something that you would like us to take away from this topic? Well, I would like to go back to the irony that, that you were describing because like that irony actually has one effect, which is the effect of introducing into a monolithic thought 
acceptance of this new hour that we needed to all accept. Think of like, you know, the health measures like during the pandemic introduce all the technocracy of, of our world introduces within this context an alternative model, kind of the, uh, the possibility of, of an alternative way of thinking or a deeper way of thinking about the same things. So in this sense, Pirandello is not against technology. Uh, he is actually pointing out to a deeper dimension of technology. He doesn't want technology to be reduced to what we call or label as tech. Uh, technology is way more than what we call tech. Uh, um, the, 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 it's really a, an expression of the human desire to multiply our experience with reality, to extend it, uh, to extend the, the dimensions of the body. Think of the bicycle that expands the muscles of the, of the legs. So in this sense, Pirandello is not against this. He wants to avoid the reduction of this to being mere repetition or mean, uh, or something that is meaningless. Um, in this sense, the set of eyes of Serafino Gubbio uh, or the set of eyes of uh, Pirandello in the, in the irony of his, of his novelle opens up a question, uh, which is uh, really, what, what is the meaning and value of, of the things we use? And um, in the sense that the, the, instance of the issue of the duration is, is important because like a value is something that can last over time. Uh, so this is also the sense of luxury. Uh, Italy is very well placed in the category of luxury because luxury is that product that aspires to last over time. And um, in this sense, culture is a way to interrogate industrial developments, to form uh, new paths, for example, in the development of design as this intermediate language between production and authorship and creation that we talked about. But culture is ultimately what creates uh, genuineness, authenticity uh, in, in serial products. And when I say serial products, I'm not, I just don't mean the products we use, but also the books, because also books are produced serially. So in this sense, what is that thing that allows us to... Um, see these products as a unique relationship with us. Mm -hmm. the, the same unique relationship that we have when we open a book and an author speaks individually to us. In the same way, apply this to uh, objects. Uh, it, it, it is quite remarkable. In this sense, culture is indispensable. And the takeaway from all this, uh, which comes from Pirandello, but comes from this general sense of Italian culture of cultura industria that work together is really, um, the development of, of a model that is quite innovative. And so this is what I do in the Italian Innovators uh, YouTube show, uh, where I present this impact of culture in the development of new forms, for example, in fashion. Uh, think of Elsa Schiaparelli, who works with Dali uh, to transform a dress into a work of art, or uh, Brunello Cucinelli, who um, describes his entrepreneurship in reference to philosophy. Uh, so the application of philosophy to entrepreneurship or in design where we have like De Perro that designs for Campari a bottle. Um, bottle is an obsession of, of futurists from Bocconi uh, to, to De Perro. But like where else in the United States you will have like an artist, top notch artist that designs a bottle. So in this sense, the idea is to turn the product, the iconic uh, Campari bottle into a work of art, something that lasts. Or uh, the idea of technology, we talked about bicycles. Uh, Bianchi, Eduardo Bianchi, who is the uh, inventor of the bicycle with um, wheels of equal size, uh, connects bi bicycles with uh, tourism and sports and narrations. Uh, bicycles really enter Italian literature in a million ways from Campana, Gozzano, Pirandello, but also again, uh, to turn cinema, like uh, um, Pirandello does with Ser Serafino Gubbio, the observation of what happens in front, in the set, but also the reversing of, of the camera toward the eye that is looking. Uh, this is like the six characters in search of an author, but this will become also the model for Eight and a Half by Fellini, where the object is no longer just what is in front, but also what... Uh, the vision, the act of seeing of, of the director, and then later will become like a Serna Notte d'Inverno Un Viaggiatore by Calvino, if, uh, where, where Calvino uh, shows us himself in the act of 
writing. So uh, this external internal perspective allow like a, the development of a different perspective and a more mature perspective and also this uh, availability and um, disposition to create, which is really in Italian sense faced with the everlasting Italian crisis <laughs> over the last past seven years. Uh, it's really a, a, a creative urgency. So in the sense, Italy is still uh, in this situation is still in crisis and is still one of the top laboratories of, of innovation in the world. Mm, absolutely. I cannot agree more, especially with, the, with this idea of irony. I, as, I, as you were saying it, I mean, irony in our current times, like how can, we, how can we make that useful for a critique of technology or tech? As you said before, that's just kind of the space of literature. It's the space of culture. And today we cannot criticize, we cannot have a critical approach towards technology through the news or through uh, philosophy, or through the historical discourse. That doesn't work. We need art, we need literature to kind of give us that extra complex, uh, more balanced approach as a way of addressing. Yeah, also as a free space, really. Uh, fiction is really a bubble based on the premise, like, let's pretend. <laughs> Uh, fingere, uh, where we can actually talk about things that are in front of us mm. by inventing them in a deeper way than actually observing them directly. And uh, again, uh, Sergio Leone talks about the crisis of the 1960s in Italy by opening a space in the American West, where those same issues and contention and uh, social tension is expressed in the bubble of a somewhere else. Uh, and this generates a disposition to actually talk about it and overcome the difficulties and sometimes the clash between factions in, in, in a, that we will have like in a direct straightforward approach. Kind of, it would be. Um, so in the sense that the power of literature is, is really fundamental uh, for, for a critical awareness, but also for the development of uh, innovative solutions and, and ways of thinking. Thank you, Luca. This has been so enriching and excellent. Time flew by like nothing. We have here with us Michael Studialka, the co-president of the Pirandello Society of America. Michael, would you like to ask a question? Would you, is there anything? <laughs> Ciao, Michael. <laughs> we, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> there we go. It was almost seamless and perfect, but tech is never perfect. No, I mean, it's been a fascinating, a fascinating discussion. And I think that you've um, sort of wrapped things up so nicely that there's, there's so, well, there's so many more things to say, but there's so little to say in, in a sense as well. I, I was really fascinated by the discussion of um, Mondo di Carta, which is actually a short story that was um, just recently translated and published in our last issue of PSA, the journal by Marella Feltrin Morris, uh, translated from Ithaca College. Um, and so, so if people listening are, are interested in that story and wanna find an English version of it, um, you'll find that in our most recent, um, our most recent journal, yeah. Um, but I, I think that if I were gonna ask one question to kind of sum this up, and, and you kind of started touching on this, Luca, um, in, in some of your last comments when you were thinking about the six characters and this model of kind of transforming um, representation toward the consideration of, of the grounds of representation themselves, right? The, the eye of the viewer and all of these sorts of aspects that come out there. Um, uh, I wonder if you think that there's this kind of tension in Pirandello's work then between the kind of um, the representation, if we think of it in a kind of almost more um, verista form, right, of, of a rural modernity, right, uh, this kind of moment of modernization in rural context, um, and the kind of um, forward-looking experimentalism of his formal um, techniques in something like um, six characters or Matthias Pascal or these more sort of typically modernist works, right? I mean, do you see a tension there or do you see them as actually being kind of uh, two component parts of this same dynamic in some sense? Well, to me, well, well certainly, thank you for the question, but like uh, there is certainly a, a verista representation in um, uh, Leonora Dio, like uh, the, the the Sicilian countryside, and also the countryside where the Ora Italica, which was the Italic hour based on uh, the 
which were starting from the sunset, which were still um, present in Italy uh, until the 19th century. Also, Laura di Barga by Pascoli is um, referencing the, the Oritarica. So in the sense, the, the Verista take is a documentary take. But I think Pirandello goes beyond that uh, a lot. And uh, especially the experiment with theater is what allows him to really stage positions, uh, not like speculate about them only, but uh, use the space of theater. And actually, Mattia Pascal is a, 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 a theater in itself, uh, uh, where we have, again, the external and internal perspective of the same character uh, that is observing. But like with, with, with this theatrical space, uh, Pirandello wants to give um, depth, volume, to these ideas. Um, so I think the uh, contribution that this gesture uh, does is to move from a mere documentary approach of culture, so reporting things or mirroring things in the in the imitative take, say in, in, uh, in painting, <laughs> um, to uh, a more abstract, call it ironic, uh, call it like whatever we want, but like a, a, an abstract way of thinking that is aimed at asking a question the same way as a Picasso painting, which is not immediately clear, is not immediately representative, is aimed at um, opening a different perspective or asking a question and opening up a space of re-elaboration against kind of like the dictatorship of what technocracy or the state or the industrialization the market can impose upon us so in this sense this critical voice that is not just critical but also creative uh, in, in this theatrical space because by staging it uh, you can connect ideas and this is the tradition of, uh, of Italian theater of Italian opera where in this space many different languages uh, of scenography, of dance, or music, or writing, or uh, lighting, uh, converge uh, and find a synthesis, in a temperate synthesis. And they have to dialogue together to find the synthesis. Otherwise, it's a mess. <laughs> so in this sense, the theater of Pirandello stages this in a, a phenomenal way, this, this search for uh, a, 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 an answer, a solution, or a path, or, or, or a way within this modern world. Not resigned, not resigned at all. Yeah, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I really appreciate hearing that because I think there's been this tendency to, there's been an overwhelming narrative, especially perhaps in the kind of school book way that Pirandello gets taught as a kind of classic, right? In the curriculum of thinking of him as this overwhelmingly pessimist kind of rejecting uh, figure, rejecting modernity, skeptical of all these changes, this crisis. And I think you're pointing out the ways in which there's this really productive element to the irony and the sort of conceptual space that exists together with the aesthetic representation in, in sort of the staging of that uh, that interrogation that you're talking about. Well, this this is also kind of the role of our of intellectuals in, in our in our contemporary world. The, the question that Gozzano asks to the bicycle, vola dove? Uh, flies where the bicycle it's a question that we can ask uh honestly in front of like you know the development of like uh, social media uh, mm -hmm. where are they going what do they uh certainly uh, pirandello opens it up in an ironic way uh but it also in a serious way in, in, yeah. in other in other works but it's, it's a key question to not refrain from progress but to produce a progress that actually is meaningful mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, to wrap up our conversation here. Thank you so much, Michael, for your question. Luca, it's been such an honor to finally meet you and be able to talk to you about this topic. My honor. <laughs> so next, uh, our next meeting will be on February 19th with Professor Daniela Bini from UT Austin on Pirandello's Women, uh, uh, an interesting topic <laughs> I hope for with, we'll talk about Marta Abba and his approach in general in literature towards women. And again, Luca, thank you so much. And while we're speaking of Pirandello, and Gozzano's question, uh, Vola, Pero Dove, all these YouTube conversations, all the speaking and talking that we do, I would like to end again with a quote from Pirandello that encourages us in this world of technology and of madness, as you said, uh, Luca, to kind of be able to listen and to listen to others and to 
gather all the voices of others into ourselves, almost as if we were some sort of a sound recording device. And I would read the quote to finish our meeting today from Serafino Gubbio. Vorrei non parlar mai, accogliere tutto e tutti in questo mio silenzio ogni pianto, ogni sorriso, perché tutti dentro di me trovassero non solo dei loro dolori, ma anche più delle loro gioie, una tenera pietà che li affrettelasse almeno per un momento. I should like never to speak at all, to receive everyone and everything in the silence of mine, every tear, every smile, so that all might find in me, not only for their griefs, but also and even more for their joys, a tender pity that would make us all brothers if only for a moment. Thanks, Mr. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Follow That's us. it. Follow Lucas, uh, uh, Lucas excellent uh, um, podcast, Italian innovators, and we'll see each other again in two weeks. Thank you. Grazie.